All right, it's recording now. So, <clears throat> Brian McKenzie, thank you for being here. Uh, before conversations, I oftentimes will do some type of super ventilatory type maneuver. So we'll huff and puff, do like you know a Wim Hof type scenario. Uh -huh. um, I'd be curious what your recommendation, if you wanted to get the nervous system to be in a kind of upregulated, stimulated, activated space, what would be like your formula? Well, if you have a problem being on when you're talking or when you're interviewing or having a conversation with people, hmm. um, that would be the, a go-to move. Hmm. If that is not your problem, meaning I know I don't have a problem turning on when I'm asked questions, like when I do, when I go to have conversations or I do speaking gigs, I do, I would avoid that like the plague. Um, oh, cause you get nervous. Well, no. Oh, no, 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 no. It's just, you're just, you're just drawing on energy. You're drawing on excess ATP. You're drawing on, you're, you're, you're putting the cells in an excited state. Um, so you're driving your arousal level up um, when you're actually going to be doing that anyway. Right. So right. for most people who I've worked with, with stand up comics and like, you know, professional speakers, uh, you know, uh, you know, your, your, um, intellectual types, et cetera. Um, I'm usually doing down regulation stuff for them yeah. before they go on. Yeah. Because that the makes calmer sense. you are, the, the more creative you can be. You can't be, you can't be creative, high stimulated. You're just going to mm. on to environment and what's going on. Okay. Well then, <clears throat> so let's just ditch the actual, uh, doing a breath work thing since, there's no, uh, hey, you, know, or, you, you, you can go rip into it if you want. Like I, I'm not here to stop that. Uh, I just got done with a, a sauna cold plunge session. My nervous system's like, oh, you're fucking crazy. Well, my nervous system's well fine right now. Fine, uh, so instead let's just break down. You just got this. done lifting. So I'm well, we're, good. we're tapped in. So I would love just to break down some like specificity around what exactly is happening with the mm -hmm. various different, uh, breathing maneuvers that we have access to. Yeah. So what does down regulation look like? What does up regulation look like? Um, and, and particularly like the specifics of what's happening during uh, super ventilation or hyper ventilation or the huffing and puffing that, that you'd see become popularized in the last however long since Wim Hof came along. And then yeah. obviously holotropic breathing and it's been something that's been along for around for a very long time. Uh -huh. uh, but I'd love to, to maybe start off with like what exactly me metabolically speaking is happening with that um, and then what are some of the potential downfalls that are happening with that uh, and some of the things that maybe we think are happening that are not in fact happening with that yeah um so you want to i mean yeah so the, it, it's a rabbit hole uh depending on the information that you do want yeah um you know we can talk about from an arousal state so your nervous system um so I guess I could start there since the nervous system is really first respondent, really to stressor, um, right? You're taking in information, waves, et cetera. You're making sense of that through nervous energy. Um, so from a height, from a super ventilation standpoint, when we're talking about the nervous system and we talk about arousal, I, by, and I just want to preface, this is not a diagnosis for anything. This is just talking about an arousal state continuum. Andrew Huberman will talk about the same shit. Um, th uh, that said, on in dead center of arousal state, you've got a neutral state. To, let's just call it the left, we've got that par more of that parasympathetic branch, which you now move into calm. Then you move into tired and sleepy. Then you move into depressed, right? So... From the neutral state moving right into the sympathetic arm, you're looking to focus. That is the next state above neutral, right? Would be like a, a, a focus state. Then you've got, you're, you're moving towards what would be like your um, anxious or stressed state. Um, and then beyond that becomes like full-blown panic attack, right? Yep. Um, super ventilation is an up-regulation tool that is used to typically, if we're talking about the Wim Hof method, create a rebound effect into the parasympathetic side of things. So meaning a normal stress response to a moderate stressor or, be, or low, lower, right? 
you got this swing that happens that goes up. Every human being has it where the sympathetic nervous system activates. doesn't matter who you are, Navy SEAL, Aaron Alexander, or mom on the couch. Okay. It goes up and then it comes back down. And as it comes back down, your parasympathetic branch starts to come back online and you calm down, right? That's the intention of something like from an arousal side of the Wim Hof method. When you move into something like holotropic breathing, that doesn't equate for that. That hmm. goes beyond that. And that's where you can get in trouble with things like the Wim Hof method where you continue to do it, do it and you continue to stack and stack and go into more uh, and I can get into this in a minute to the side of resp uh, acute respiratory alkalosis, which has a myriad of problems with it um, that have very big compounding problems that can follow suit. Uh, that said, if you're pretty healthy, you're not going to really run into that stuff. So being healthy is a good thing, right? Um, you move probably around two hours a day, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway. So from, from a nervous system standpoint, when you go in and you superventilate, we're looking to activate things and then bring it back down and bring it back down to a calm state. So you bring it back past that neutral into a calm state. So that's what you typically would feel after doing like a round of superventilation and then holding your breath or just calmly sitting there or doing a slow controlled breathing after that. You will drop back out feel calm and feel a little bit energized. And that's because you're basically, you've created metabolically some energy. Um, so what we've done is we've asked for more energy to occur by really stripping out carbon dioxide. And when you strip that out, oxygen and nitric, nitric oxide and oxygen now don't get to go to work for the cells as much. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not like it's been all CO2 has been removed, but enough has been removed so that you're not offloading a lot of that O2 now. So that's why you'll see on a pulse oximeter, people will show you a pulse oximeter and their, you know, SpO2 goes up to 99 or 100 is you actually have, bi you have biologically unavailable oxygen at that point because you can't offload it. And when you don't have oxygen present for your cells and mitochondria to use, you're, you're the intelligence of what you are takes over and we now go into more anaerobic cellular metabolism. So you create a kind of high energy frequency, right? That takes over the nervous system short term, but for people who deal with uh, anxiety, anxiousness, panic attacks, et cetera, um, I've found over the course of probably the last five or six years, um, this has proven to be a very ineffective tool for that. Mm -hmm. Um, because these types of individuals don't manage stress real well, uh, throughout the day and are not creating a buffer between that and <laughs> what they're doing with the breathing. Right. Yeah. So if they've got this constant emotional energy occurring and overthinking energy going, you, your, our, your arousal state is already, like I said, you're in this anxious, stressed state already. So why would we throw ourselves more into that or on top of that? And what's, what's happening specifically with uh, oxygen and CO2 when you are hyperventilating? So you're, 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 you're disposing of, of CO2 yeah. and you are, when, what's, what was, what's the oxygen doing it's, with, with that? It, well, the oxygen is not doing anything is what it's not doing. You're not bringing, mm. you're not actually br bringing any more oxygen into the system. Mm. What you're doing is retarding the ability to use oxygen. This and is when that, would that come back to the bore effect? Right. Correct. That this what's happening. Bore, so yeah, you're, reduced you're, you're CO2. The dissociative curve, which is the Bohr effect, which is a principle, they yeah. actually need an acid to kick off this alkaline, which is the oxygen, <laughs> in order for it to be usable. So the pH, this is where pH comes, your chemistry, right? This is why it's important that this is why our biology keeps our pH in such a narrow range. This is part of the reason why it does that, right? Mm -hmm. The other parts are your entire... the in, the entirety of your biochemistry functions at in this homeostatic place of 7.35 or roughly, right? 
to yeah. seven point four five. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so uh, the Bohr effect is increased CO two, if I remember correctly. Increased. Oh yeah, yes, 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 yes. Increased CO two increases. Yes, and then also, is it decreased pH or increased pH reduces the? So you increase the pH, so you become more alkaline. Right. And that and and is and that causes your hemoglobin to have a higher or lower affinity to you holding on to oxygen. Yeah, the, the hemoglobin won't release as much oxygen now. So it doesn't right. have the ability to release the oxygen. So as you increase the the saturation of CO2, mm-hmm. it causes your body to be able to more effectively release oxygen. Offloads. Correct. Right. Hence why actually breathing less, you know, and having like elongated exhalations and working on breath holds and, you know, making your, your breath so that it's almost imperceptible, you know, and slowing it down or is going to actually make you. majority of the populace, yes. And this is where it's going to kind of get a little uh, paradoxical. Um, yeah. Is. Yeah. And so, so that's my, my hope and intention with this conversation is to be able to create a, a pretty like clear outline of mm-hmm. the, the way in which we can toggle our, our, our autonomic nervous system mm-hmm. through our, you know, our, our, res- our respiration. And so ranging like one end of the range, long exhalation, breath holds, you know, reducing the amount of ventilation and then the other end being super ventilation and kind of like the effects yeah. in between that space. Uh, so yeah, so st- still sticking around with this, the super ventilation part, mm-hmm. what, is there a time, when is the time and a place for super ventilation? And when I say super ventilation, what, what, what does that mean exactly? Does that be like huffing and puffing? <sighs> is that what we define as super ventilation? Hi- hyperventilation. Um, yeah, hyperventilation. Intended hyperventilation. Like I am literally consciously taking on the, the motion of or yeah, yeah. which I'm that's another thing I'd like to I'm intentionally over breathing. Yeah. And that's another thing within, within the context of over breathing, there's yeah. also the potential of over nose breathing and over mouth breathing. Oh yeah. Breath so that's breath. another, that's an, that's a, another space I'd like to, to clear up as well. Cause I think there's a, a lot of, of uh, like blurry mercurial, kind of floating information in this space and and a lot of people you know holding breathwork classes and yoga instructors and such that um you know have like a, a vague sense mm-hmm. of what they're actually conveying with all this stuff but you know I'd, I'd love to clear it up for my myself as, as well so that so that would be an, another potential bifurcation of of super ventilation or hyperventilation through the nose versus the mouth so just kind of like putting a little like like footnote on that. Yeah, you want me to dive into that? Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the mouth, uh, you move more air faster, um, and that is l- literal. Um, I can move all my air out fast, and I can move m- all the air in faster. Versus, that's double the time what mm. it took my nose now. For me to move the air as fast as I move it through my mouth, right? I'd have to shorten the breathing pattern to where it's. Now you're moving into things like Kabbalah Bhati or Breath of Fire, right? Which yeah. are tools that are used inside the yoga world. Um, they've been using stuff like this for 5,000 years or so, right? Um, there, there's a pl- there's a time and a place they use them. Um, typically, it's you know at the end of these sessions that they've done, where they've been sl- they've had the breathing slowed and working into positions that are very difficult. Um, that said, they both can have the same effect. One is going to take longer than the other because I am restricted with how much air I can actually move through my nose, so I won't exactly get the ex- the the same. Um, biochemical effect is quickly with my nose, right? In, in typical right. fashion, right? But if I do 10 breaths, right? I barely feel a change, right? But if I do, yeah. there's the change. Or and what I, is, and, and what exactly is the biochemical effect of hyperventilation? 
So that, that is where we are, are shifting the pH into more alkaline state. So we're offloading the CO2. So we're diminishing. So we're moving carbon dioxide from the bloodstream, right? We, we, it starts with the lungs, but it then preclude, it moves so fast that we're, we're extracting the CO2 because the body doesn't stop producing energy. You die if that happens, right? Mm. So one of the byproducts of that energy outside of heat and water is CO2. CO2 is constantly being extracted through those capillaries in the alveolar in the alveolar beds of the lungs. So as I breathe faster, I'm removing that carbon dioxide faster, right? So I'm yep. scrubbing that out while there's excess all this oxygen still going in. It's the same amount of oxygen, right? Like at rest, an inhale through my nose does not um, have me absorbing any more oxygen than that. Yeah. Same. Isn't it, 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 wouldn't you be actually absorbing less oxygen with the, just the, like the, the mechanics of breathing through your mouth? You're not going to be able to get the, the air as down low into the lungs Correct. comparatively? For most of us. If yeah. you have trained enough with your, with your primary breathing muscles, you're probably fairly, like I can pull yeah. it pretty quickly. I can, yeah, you can find it. Yeah. But yeah. for those that do not practice stuff like this, no, they will not. The and what about in the chest? And, and what about, so who would the hyperventilation be for? Cause I, I think something that, that, you know, yeah, in, so if we go in, back in the realm to the of state thing and we just look at ourselves, right. And without diagnosing ourselves, like I try to keep people out of the diagnosis state but, and let, yeah. let them leave that to the therapists. Um, but if you sit more in this depressed kind of sleepy, tired state a lot, I, I mean, the first thing is, is why are you always tired? Are you not getting enough rest? The second thing is like, you'd probably benefit from some super ventilation to mm. bring you back up. If you're having to do that all day long, that's an, that's an issue. Um, that, that, that's something that needs much more digging and, and figuring out with what we're doing. But when you are in this more calm, tired, sleepy, or depressed area, doing some super ventilation will bring you back more towards that neutral or focused state hmm. that you essentially would want to be in. Right. And are you tapping into, to like endogenous in, endorphins? Are you kind of like opening up your own opiate cabinet a bit with it in that as well? Or is it do you know anything about that? More so what we're doing is we are uh, tapping into the adrenaline and norepinephrine, the norepinephrine, mm. dopamine, serotonin, which also would have like an analgesic effect of Correct. sorts. Correct. Yeah. yeah. This is a, a big uh, dragon chaser for people um, mm. is chasing that feeling of bliss. Uh, yeah. You know, um, so that that's just another thing to be kind of aware of. Right. And that that bliss sensation. So I did a breathwork um, class. Yeah. I don't know. If it was like two days ago or so. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty fun. You know, like it's like psychedelic. You know, yeah. I'm seeing geometrical patterns and I'm seeing a bright light and I saw a big like purple heart in the middle of it. And, you know, I've got like the tetanies going on, which I'd love to, to break down what, what that is exactly as well. Like the claw hands and, you know, it's, it's a trip. Like you're really, you're, you're tripping, you know, yeah. is that, is that a, a lack of oxygen to the brain? Is that like, like what, how do we describe that kind of psychedelic experience that can manifest just from a handful of rounds of, of super ventilation. Like what exactly is happening for that to become psychedelic, you know, and emotional. And suddenly you're starting to feel into deeply stored sensations and feelings that you might've not touched on, you know, since you were a child, you know, and I think that gets in like the Stan Groff realm and the holotropic mm -hmm. breathing, kind of like the function of that. Mm -hmm. How do we bridge science with kind of that like meta physic physics aspect of it? Well, the basic, version of that of what's happening is is your brain thinks you're dying hmm. so, due to a lack of oxygenation to the brain correct yeah. your, your nervous system is no longer getting the adequate oxygen so it's not actually able to use the energy effectively anymore 
Yeah. Um, the tetany is a, a response to that. That's so you're going into respiratory alkalosis, um, acute because you were here with me. Um, <laughs> if it became chronic, you would probably not be here with me right now. Yeah. Um, which has happened on a number of occasions with a number of people. Um, but what, what wow. that tetany is, is you're, you're setting off a lot of the, um, hydrogen and potassium, calcium, you're, you're, you're fucking with the electrolytes and mm. minerals in the cell cytoplasm. Mm. And that is why your hands begin to cramp. So, so these are the first things to go. So think of it like in terms of cold, like if I were, you know, stuck in freezing water, what's yep. the first thing to go? My limbs, my toes and my fingers, right? And then it just starts moving away from there. Your body, the intelligence of you knows what to do. So it just starts to shut things down on the limb. Oh, it shuts down the periphery. Correct. So your hands. And so that's to conserve oxygen. It would be conserving oxygen or blood to the, to, to oh, the viscera, same, to the same. organs. Same, same blood, oxygen. It's all. Wow. The same. Oh yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So it could there, and could there be some health benefit of that to have seen perhaps like some super saturation of the trunk? You know, uh, of, the, of the, of the viscera, not for a healthy individual. No. Mm. Yeah. Don't think so. All right. All the, right. the, the, the benefit from, from breathing techniques like this is that they have a deep, profound impact on the individual that brings up things that they end up, that we end up addressing or looking at, um, yeah. the other, everything outside of that, there is no physiological benefit to it based on what I've come to understand and I have right. participated in all of it. <laughs> yeah. It's weird because, you know, like Moshe Feldenkrais, I know you're a fan of various different like esoteric type yeah. modalities and like, you know, yoga and, and different movement modalities and such. But Moshe Feldenkrais, he has a, a term that I'm enamored by called parasitic tension. Uh -huh. And, you know, parasitic tension would, would be that those deeply stored subconscious tensional patterns that we have in our bodies that are just slowly eating away at, at caloric slash psycho-emotional energy yeah. throughout the day. And it's just these compensatory patterns that we just chronically hold. Yes. And in that, you know, if you're holding onto those patterns for 10, 20, 30, you know, your whole life years, uh, that was a lot of unnecessary parasitic energy that was just being pulled from you. And so if you could use something such as perhaps a breath work uh, or maybe therapy or, yeah. you know, psychedelics, whatever the thing is to be able to find like, oh my God, I can't believe I've been partially clenching my jaw, you know, or my diaphragm or maybe even like my heart or, you know, my pelvic floor or whatever yeah. for this amount of time. And finally this thing that seemingly on the face, physiologically, metabolically speaking is actually unhealthy and dangerous actually allowed me to unearth these aspects of myself to have this breakthrough to have deeper relaxation it's kind of confusing and maybe everything i just said was just a bunch of bullshit but i mean it's wow. like it's it's a wow. weird wow. territory no no you, you, you're a good dude you're searching you are open to so much and <laughs> not, no no, no you, you, you're not wrong it's an absolutely <laughs> yes it can <laughs> this out. So as soon as you started talking about it, I'm like, okay, like here, do you know where, what the word yoga means? Yoke union. Yush. Come together. Right. Yeah. And you're, I'm pretty sure you're very aware that there's no version of the original yoga that's really being taught in the Western world anymore for good reason. Right. Yeah. Like yeah, yoga is mostly, I mean, one, like, asana is just one of one of the limbs the actual movement part but it's mostly to get back to meditation it's like the function of yoga samadhi stillness union yeah connect connection with all yeah and i talked to several people who were original practitioners with bks or you know patabi joyce um of which they you know all these people confirmed there's no way anybody today would put up with the shit that they were doing and how they were going about it and I don't mean in a sexual way. I mean, in how hardcore it was. Yeah. And we're, we seem to all be searching for something, a way to release and, and get down to the core of things. And breathing is one of those ways to do it. The other yeah. way is to just let go. 
<laughs> the another way would be I've I've seen people do it through high intensity exercise. Uh, sure. I see, which people, also is is breathing. It's just breathing right. with like the actual the, the, the rest of your physiology is is right. engaged. Yeah, you yeah. actually have the metabolic component connected to it. Yeah, it's the big difference. Which that's another question I have. Yeah, as well, the, because what you're replicating, um, and I apologize for the tangential nature of all this, but you're with, with hyperventilation, you're replicating. You're at ten thousand feet, huffing and puffing, trying to get to the top of a mountain. You know, or not necessarily, it's not necessarily an altitude thing because that, that would be a little bit different, but you're replicating, you're working really freaking hard. You're at fifth gear to use mm -hmm. your, your language yeah. and you are huffing and puffing and you're going through it. Is there a difference between that huffing and puffing um, experience that you'd have with a ruck on your back when you're like, you know, you're, you're at like, like level five, you know, you're trained as hard as you can um, and just laying there completely sedentary huffing and puffing? Yeah. There's a major difference. What's the difference? Your the demand for the energy. So you actually have a demand for that level of output versus forcing a response to something that doesn't have that type of output, right? So metabolically speaking, your your when you go put a rock on and go up a hill, right? your legs, your body start to quickly increase in demand for oxygen. So think of it as like a bunch of buckets, right? Everything works mm. for oxygen in the human body. And we understand this through bioenergetics, e even at, at the, in the milliseconds that happen in the, um, you know, phosphate and energy pathway, right? That's still sucking off of transcending down through the oxygen pathway. It all kind of fuels itself. Right. So the moment the cells get this demand for work there, that goes up and the byproduct of that becomes this exhaust, right? CO2, heat, heat is lost to that energy. Like 80% of, in most of us, 80% of all energy is lost to heat, right? Mm. Um, which plays a part in breathing as well because pressure CO2, all this stuff starts changing. And so our respiration rate changes as a result of that because that demand or that delivery system that's going for oxygen is kicking off something as well that's signaling to the brain, yo, breathe more so we can offload this exhaust that you've got and we can onboard this other stuff. And it, it's, it's poor terminology in that CO2 has been given a bad rap um, right. in, in the fact that like I'm saying it's an exhaust. It really is not. It actually like oxygen is basically the most destructive molecule we know of here, right? Like it quite literally is. It's destroying everything. It's oxidizing everything, including us. Yeah, that's the value of hyperbaric oxygen chambers. It's actually creating a, a stressor. That's why right. it mobilizes stem cells because your body's like, oh right. shit, we need, we need to get to work. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Right. CO2 makes this destructive, worthless gas usable to coerce an enzymatic process that is so complex, we can't replicate it. The Krebs cycle. Right. So, you know, all of that is going on. That demand goes up when there's work. I'm working right when I'm working out or I'm moving. So my breathing follows that or. I, on your, on what you're asking is, is, or I'm just sitting there and I start to breathe as if I were going up that hill. <sighs> well, now I'm triggering some of those processes, but there's no demand, right? Mm. So this in part plays into what we're seeing with inside uh, our failed concept of modern living. And I say that as a participant. We don't move enough. It requires like, like basic movement is like two to three hours. You need at least two hours a day of constant movement, right? We don't, nobody meets, hardly anybody meets that, right? I mean, I meet it now, but like, and you probably meet that, but the vast majority of the population does not, but yet the vast majority of the population has a respiration rate that's well above 18, 
which is basically mild version of hyperventilation, right? Yeah. You go into the ER, the normal respiration rate is 20 at the ER based on what a few nurses have been able to do. Is, are you saying like, like 20 breaths per second? 20 breaths per minute, per minute. I yeah. mean, sorry, not, but yeah, so yeah, per minute. Yeah. yeah. 20 breaths per second. That'd be a lot. So that's just, that's just, that's just really greedy hemoglobin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it's not just the hemoglobin. It's the whole system. Ha- so your, our biology is, is, is so powerful and so magical. And our problem is, is that we're, we're overthinking overstressed beings who don't move enough because if we did move enough, we wouldn't think it as much as we did, which would create this over breathing problem that we seem to see. We seem to, we seem to have with the vast majority of the population. And this, I'm, I'm not suggesting that breathing is the sole issue here. It is not. It's, it's actually a mental, it's a, it's a mind thing. This is why we won't see changes really in health. I mean, we, we have an ill society because people think they need to do more and we need to do less in terms mm. of the thinking game. Um, yeah. See the fasting as well. It's yeah, like, if you, you, like the lessons you learn from fasting are, are immense. You know, it's like you, you spend your whole life or I spend my whole life, you know, endlessly going over like scrutinizing over all the different types of foods that I need and the supplements and the proteins. And, you know, before I, if I would go on a, a, a trip traveling someplace, you know, like the, just the a, a quantity of supplements that I'd bring just be so ridiculous. And I still do bring a lot of supplements today, but I've also going through periods where I'd fast. The longest fast I've done is I've done several three day fasts. And then I, I feel so good that I start working out and then I like blow it out. And I'm like, Oh my God, I need to, I need to get some food. No, but during those time frames, um, that those were interesting experiences of of realizing, like, oh my god, like less is more. You know, in 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 that context of those moments, specifically for me, I don't know, fasting is for everybody, or maybe it's different for women or men or whatever. That you know, detail, I'm not an expert of fasting, but that was an interesting lesson for me of actually being like, the less I was consuming, the better I was feeling. Whereas before, I was scrutinizing over how do I get more and how is more going to help me. I think it's a similar kind of type thing with, with breathing, you know, as opposed to coming from a place of getting more air, actually getting less causes your body to be more efficient with what it has. Yes. I mean, look, a quieted mind, a meditative mind, like that brain, that nervous system, that respiration rate is far below the norm, far, far below the norm, which is exactly where when you get blood labs, you have your blood work done, you should be way better than the norm. And if you're not, and you're somebody who's participating in activity, it's you're, if you're covering the bases of more than two hours of movement a day, um, I, I would challenge like anybody, like, like they probably are a pretty healthy individual. Um, mm-hmm. granted, you know, not eating fast food every meal, but that, you know, there's some arguments and I, and I, and I, and I, and, you know, I observe this a lot, a lot of experts who are far smarter in the, these fields than I am, but, you know, at that 12 to 16 hours a week of output, meaning two hours a day, um, you really don't have to worry about how much you eat or whatever you eat, whatever you, y- your body feels it needs. And yeah, that, I find that too. Yeah. And you will quite literally get the nutrients you need. You are, you required because you're going to eat so much more food because between like, I think it's something like 3,500 and 4,500 calories for an individual in that, you know, period, you're quite literally consuming so much that you're pulling the nutrients and everything from it. But the problem is, is that we don't have that demand, right? And this is where the breathing game comes in and it's like, we see a lot of these people who are doing all these hyperventilation techniques, but they don't actually, they aren't actually living a life that really is giving them like buying them a buffer for that. Right. Mm. Right. Does that make some sense? Yeah, Um, it does. It's pretty high stress life with high stress breathing. Yeah. So it's like, you're already exhausted and, 
the, our solution to your exhaust is something exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I love weightlifting, bro. Like love it. Um, so, you know, I, I do it at least three days, three, three days a week. Right. Mm -hmm. At least, but I love endurance as well. Like I love to go on my mountain bike. I love to hike. I love to do interval work. Like I love to do that type of stuff. Um, so I do that three or four days a week. Right. And there's this place where it's like, okay, well, how much more breathing do I need to be doing? Because I'm actually containing or controlling my breathing with inside what it is I'm doing in those things. Right. Now, right. now I'm going to gear five with some of that stuff, but I'm also in like a very good gear one with a, a lot of that stuff. Right. And I'm doing a yep. ton of walking. Like I get pro I get at least 45 minutes to an hour of just low level walking effort stuff done a day on intention. Right. So I'm creating these buffers, but it's also, I've got these other things going on and it's like, now I've got work or I've, I'm jumping on a podcast and I'm talking like how much more stimulation do I need? I've got a fucking super phone, right? Like how much more stimulation do I need? And yep. my job's really been to really understand that and be able to communicate it, especially to my clients. Like, Hey, let's move over towards this stuff because you're going to do this all day. And this yep. probably is better over here. And then we yep. see things change, right? And I make changes to things in order to complement what we want to see from a health standpoint. What are some of the potential long-term side effects of a person? How, how much how much hyperventilation would be too much hyperventilation? And, and say you're doing like some type of breathwork thing. Let's call it Wim Hof breathing. Yeah, I mean, first uh, stages will be like, uh, you'll start to see some sleep insomnia related stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you will see a uh, lack of recovery, right? Like you're just not responding to training, uh, in, in a way that you feel like you should be. Um, those are really the first signs. Then it starts to become things like adrenal fatigue, uh, which isn't sure. really a thing, but it's like, we're talking about, you're starting to shut some things down. You're living off of cortisol, adrenaline, you're finding it hard to shut down to regulate. If you can't take a nap it, during the day, like if you got the opportunity, that's probably a good sign. You probably shouldn't be doing any hyperventilation stuff. Um, you know, your nervous system should be that of like an, a dog who could just stop and then curl down and take a nap. But most of us are wound up so much that we can't. Um, beyond that, you start to see autoimmune issues, cardiac issues, et cetera. You will start to see high levels of cortisol uh, or uh, your cholesterol levels raise, et cetera. It's, I mean, it just goes on and on. Hmm. Yeah. And that would be, that would be for a person that is already in like a chronically kind of stressed or upregulated type nervous system baseline, or would this be yeah. any, yeah. any you'll person? See resting heart rate stuff. You'll see HRV stuff, lower HRV, lower HRV, um, yeah. it, or it won't move type of thing. Um, you know, it, who would, who would that type of breathing be for? you not your type like, A personalities, not mm -hmm. your type A go-getter personalities. And for those folks, once or twice a week is perfectly fine, right? Yeah. You know, right. like James Nestor, I think, does it once a week. Yeah. Right? It seems reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. It goes, it does one, you know, 30 or 45 minute or one hour class of like some hyperventilation shit and, you know, loves it once a week. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so, okay. So that's, is there anything else that should be said around hyperventilation and is there a difference between superventilation, hyperventilation? I think superventilation sounds cool. Superventilation is just like the, the intended use of hyperventilation, right? Yeah. Hyperventilation yeah. is really determined as, as like over breathing, unintentional. Yeah. yeah. I feel smarter when I see, I feel like more performance based and, and advanced when I say superventilation. I feel like yeah, I know you, what I'm talking about. We all do. I think yeah. Rob and I created that word anyway. So like, it was like, yeah, let's create a cool word. I like, I like it. Is there anything else that, that ought be known in the realm of, of yeah. hyperventilation? Don't, like, just, just... Obviously, obviously, shallow water blackouts is a thing. Don't do it near water yeah, as far as contraindications. Yeah, I was going to get to that, but it, yeah, that was what I was getting at. It's like, look, even if you like, it. like you can hold your breath longer, you can't. That's not, even though you're holding your breath longer, that, that's not actually true. You, you don't actually have normal CO2 levels in you. So mm -hmm. it's not exactly a real breath hold. 
Um, and you don't want that breath hold anyway, because you're, sh you're shortening your time to blackout with, because when you remove all that CO2, you've got the same amount of oxygen in the cells, right? You've only got a little bit more in the red blood cells and that gets used up very quickly once CO2 starts to go up because the cells are craving right? Yep. Like the body's craving oxygen to make up for what was happening, to buffer that process. And so it offloads really quickly. And so it shortens that window to breath hold or blackout, out blackout time. Yeah. I wonder why it is that um, CO2 is the catalyst or indicator that our bodies need, need air. That just some kind of like neuronal system well, trigger. That's just the way it works. Is there it's anything actually, interesting it's about actually, that? Um, so this is some work Martin McPhillamy and I have done. Uh, it, it actually isn't really CO two. Um, oh, okay. Because, yeah. Even though well, I'm glad I asked. I was like, this seems like a stupid question. Which, yeah, now I know it's even dumber than I thought. <laughs> no, and I have said that, but we've been uncovering a bunch of new literature, and we did a course. Um, uh, on, on shift, a three-part course on this. Um, what it really comes down to is the noise in, in your head. Um, that's what's dictating your breathing, your, your respiration, uh, pat your patterning, what's hmm. going on. So the more noise that, your head is- What does that mean? Well, that just means the more overthinking you're doing. Mm. Yeah. Is that because there's actually like a biochemical expenditure of thought or Correct. is that because a story that I need to breathe? Correct. Well, you're, you're, you're both. Yeah. Yes, you are. So what it, what it's doing, you're, there's a demand for energy. There's an insane, uh, amount of ATP that gets lost to just mental stress. Right. Sure. So that in and of itself is an energy cost right now that's not necessarily raising co2 levels to create this breathing pattern it's what it's doing is it's triggering the nervous system to feel like it's uh, the simplest way to say this is to feel like it's in danger when it's not right yeah. that makes sense yeah so if i'm putting myself into more of a sympathetic state I'm turning more of my survival arm of my nervous system on, which requires me to mobile. The primary job of the autonomic, of the sympathetic nervous system is to mobilize energy that comes in the form of glucose. So if I'm constantly trying to mobilize <laughs> energy because of my thinking, I am going to have a lot of downstream effects as a result of that. Hmm. Yeah, that's like with, with free divers. There's a, a TED talk from a, a fella, which I've done a little bit of free diving and I've had the experience um, of calming yourself is the is the the most performance enhancing thing that you can possibly do. Yeah. And so it really becomes like this like unicity samadhi kind of transcendence experience where you're like the, like any thought actually translates to oxygen expenditure yes. slash all the other you know right. metab metabolic expenditures and yes. so when you're in that state the, the moment that you were to go into a sensation of a thought of like oh my god i'm too deep oh my god like i'm gonna fucking die like that it, it, it's energetic expenditure that causes the whole system to contract and shrink and now it's like whatever you think you're right <laughs> you're like yep like you're creating the situation that, that, is, that, is, <laughs> spot, that is spot on and one of the, one of the Greatest moments I got to, to, to play with that, you know, I, I've watched and been a part of a lot of professional athletes and a lot of things that have happened. I've been around a lot of operators, a lot of people in the tactical community seeing things where it almost goes in slow motion, right? Mm -hmm. But watching Laird on like a 70 foot wave, mm -hmm. when I, when we were out in Kauai and him, it just, everything calmed down. And almost like turned into like just bliss. Yeah, right. It's like, wow, everything just slowed down for him. And yeah. you can just see it, right? And you can go back and watch anything with any of these guys on, you know, at that level. Um, but Laird's such a great example of it just, as, you know, because of the way he rides big waves. Um, yeah. But that that is it. It's slow. Like you are of no benefit 
in a high stakes situation, freaking out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you are yeah. no better. Like, and I mean, we, Laird had that talk with me. He was like, look, if you don't think you should be here right now, you need to go back because this is not the place for you to not want to be. Right. And where were you? Were you on, on the boat or were, were you actually like, in the lineup? I was lineup? with them. Oh, I, I was with the crew. I was with the, I, I used to go out with them. Like in winter. That's great. Yeah, yeah. On what? Did you tow in? N- not, not on 70 foot waves. No, 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 no. Did you tow in? Have you ever towed in? Oh yeah. yeah. On anything? Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, fun. Uh, oh yeah. You. yeah, yeah. Where'd you, where'd you do that at? Uh, Kauai and, and a few other places. Uh, in oh, that's great. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. I never got, I never got to tow. Yeah. Seems like a great experience. It, it well, is. so that so that so that comes into the other side of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, unless there's anything else that would be relevant in relation to, to superventilation or hyperventilation. No, I mean just be, be aware of what you're doing, and and like I mean, if you're already ramped up and you're trying to get more ramped up, like that's not yeah. do it's not doing the physiology any benefit. Is there any is is there value? Well, I'm sure there's value. Is there value enough in the typically in in most breath work? styles there would be breath holds in between the hyperventilation so it would be 30 50 60 whatever rounds of hyperventilation and then it would be long exhalation out you know breath hold and inhalation breath hold you're, you're kind of on the opposite off effect the off with the breath holds than you are yeah. in holotropic mm. you're far better off because in holotropic it's just a constant Right. Yeah. I've never actually done holotropic. Holotropic is like pretty late. Like it's like, it's like four hours of you're just, you're going, you're like, yeah, really going some in. people do, you know, there's people do like 30, 45 minute sessions of just hyperventilation. Right. Like, yeah, it's a lot. Dude. Nah. Uh-uh. Hmm. No bueno. Like the moment your hands start doing that, it's not a good yeah. thing unless you're trying to get to some psychedelic space, which yeah. you're going to get there. It, you, you'll get there. I mean, that's pretty much always what I'm trying to do if I'm doing it. I'm like, let's like, <laughs> let's get weird. Let's. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. As 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 my good friend and doctor, to, you know, who who I've done a number of journeys with, told me he was like, "You keep dialing God up on the telephone. He keeps giving you the same answer. What the fuck are yeah. you listening to?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with that as well. <laughs> um, all right. So the other so the other side of that would be probably the the one of. The, the side of the conversation of greater relevance to everyone, which would be increasing your tolerance to CO2 and slowing down your breathing and nasal breathing and, um, you know, all the stuff that, that you gather from Buteco method or, um, things that you might read in, in, you know, the book breathe or sh- yeah. other references that I'm a big fan of shut your mouth, save your life. I yeah. think it was one that was James yeah, yeah. Kaplan, I believe, uh, jaws. Yep. It's another one. Um, I have a chapter in my book yep. about this. And I think that you might have been supportive with as well. I don't remember. I asked yep. a bunch, bunch of different people um, for that, uh, for, for help with all of the chapters. Um, but those are some resources that I think would be great. Then you have your app shift as well, which helps people immensely with all of this. Um, so I think if people want to like go deeper into all, all of that, like there's, I think all of those are really, really great resources. Um, so nasal breathing, slowing things down, uh, increasing tolerance to CO2. That's the other side of all of this. Like what's, what's the, the, the relevance of, of that in this modern world that we live in? Yeah. So since, you know, I brought up, you know, your breathing depth and rate really depends on the noise. The increasing your tolerance to CO2 seems to quiet the noise. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and that's because CO2 largely acts as a vasodilator um, and it opens up kind of the, the channels per se, the, cir- the circulatory system. Uh, it all- helps offload uh, oxygen. It increases nitric oxide production systemically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, it, it plays a profound role in our physiology. And- Increased CO2 mm-hmm. catalyzes or increases production of, of nitric oxide. Correct. Systemically. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. And then on top of that, nasal breathing is another thing that I think it's well, like, yeah. nasal breathing 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 has like 20 times, 20 times more production. Nitric oxide in the parasinuses. Right? Yeah. Um, that's not systemic. That is localized to the breathing, which is yeah. great. There's, it's all benefit. <laughs> yeah. Um, that said, 
you know, it seems that it quiets a lot of the noise that goes on, like I was alluding to, which inevitably slows the breathing down. Um, you know, my uh, count, my, my co-founder with the HHPF, um, Dr. Tanya Bentley just finished a paper on, um, uh, she, she did, a, she did a literary review of just a ton of, an absolute ton. I put it out on Twitter and it'll be up on the foundation tomorrow on Instagram, but, um, of research done on breathing techniques. And it's, it, it seems there is no one technique, <laughs> but sure. if you do more than five minutes a day, you're going to see some big changes, but yeah. it, even more than meditation, huh? Even more than meditation, from my understanding, from from what I've read, which it makes sense. If you're going to do like five minutes of something, just sitting still compared to doing some type of like regulated breathing practice, you're going to have significantly more. Quite possibly. Uh, I mean, I've met some lifelong meditators who I would never hold a candle to with people who are just breathers. But um, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. But typically meditation would be more of like, we're talking like Vipassana or like long-term type things or darkness retreats or something where you're really challenging yourself and you're really like going in with that. But if you're going, if you have five minutes to do a thing sitting in stillness compared to doing something, even if it's like a box breathing or like a physiological sigh or yeah. something of the like, which that'd be an interesting thing to break down what a physiological sigh is, that's going to have a greater metabolic effect. And, you know, you'd be able to more measurable effect from like a perspective, like an EEG or you know, you're going to have, you're going to have more distinguishable effect from actually having some type of breathing practice if you have a short amount of time i think it gets different if you're going into like long term a meditation long-term. retreat or something yeah yeah so yeah. at any rate she just finished this paper and the the caveat was is that anything over five minutes works well but mm. hyperventilation techniques not so much oh interesting yeah so that said um hyperventilation techniques can work um typically I think it's under five minutes, something like that. And then with a practitioner, with somebody guiding it. Right. Um, now I wouldn't, I, I've met far too many people and I myself have been impacted by (laughs) hyperventilation techniques. So I know that said, looking at the other end of this, um, you know, learning to tolerate more carbon dioxide really teaches you to just slow down because you get a panicky feeling towards the end of holding your breath. And yep. that's rightfully so because you're setting off a bunch of deep primal receptors, which is basically your need for urgency to do something. Why yep. would that occur? Well, if I were to jolt or something were to jump in and all of a sudden, all this energy goes up. I would want to move quickly, do something quickly, and have something available quickly. And this all plays a part in our physiology and how we we're operate. But we have become so uh, comfortable that we've forgotten that we're far better off when we don't have as much to think about. <laughs> and it's just all this thinking and all this stuff we're trying to do and jumping yeah. from one thing to the next. And, you know, I, I, and I'm as guilty as this as anybody. I've got a smartphone, I've got a computer, I've got all this stuff, uh, you know, and it, it plays a role and I have to set boundaries and I have to, uh, you know, I've learned to understand these things in a way to where I'm just not as attached to them anymore. Like I used to be in thinking I had to get to a certain place, but I didn't even like being in that place in the first place. So why was I doing that? Right. Yeah. And then yeah, the, oh, go, go no, Sorry. At, at any rate, this brings me back to, so if I slow my breathing down enough, I calm down enough. I start to feel what it's like to actually be with myself, be bored right in a moment without having to do anything that in and of itself is the beauty of what breathing can bring you. Right. Yeah. Is, is the ability to be bored again, of which Mm -hmm. so many of us struggle to do. Yeah. Being with yourself. Yeah. You know, as as opposed to having avoidant behavior, which I'm like, I'm like chock full of, I'm like a big avoidant guy. So, but I'm, I'm at least, an observation of like, Oh, there's another, 
you know, I'm fucking terrified to be alone with myself. Here, here we go. And you grab the old, grab the phone, you know, call somebody up. Hey, you want to play pickleball? Any, you know, anything? <laughs> just, it, it, I think that, that and, and breathing is such an interesting um, tool because it's like I was reading recently, I was rereading a part of Nestor's book, Breathe. And in, in that he talks about, there's a gal, she just used her, her initials. It was like, TS or something and she right. had some type of dysregulated amygdala condition. I don't know yeah. what the term for it is. Well, and I think you already know where I'm going with this. Yeah. The only this thing there was abs- what is it called? This is Dr. Justin Feinstein's work. Okay. Yeah. And it was the CO2. It was like the it was it was breathing in like a like a, a like bowl is hit of CO2. A bowl is hit of CO2 is the only so they spent years attempting to stir this chick up and just like anything that could possibly frighten her, putting her hands in snakes and spiders and, you know, like anything. And she's like, she's, she's incapable of experiencing fear. It's, it's not a part of her makeup. And the only thing that could actually get her to a point of feeling that, that anxiety that so many people are paralyzed by was just a single shot of uh, CO2, Correct. which is pretty, which is a pretty fascinating thing to be like, Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So if you extrapolate that out. The amygdala plays a, the amygdala seems to be a modulator of CO2 and she does, she has a calcified one, so there's no modulator. So boom, big hit, boom, big panic. Wow. Yeah. How interesting. Right. And that's what I was, it's like the analogy that comes to mind is, 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 you know, most of us are, are, you know, consuming like a, a buffet of oxygen and, you know, air throughout the day. And so it makes our bodies very uh, weak and inefficient in our usage and our distribution of that oxygen to actually deliver it to our, to our, our, our muscles and throughout the the rest of our system. And so our, our hemoglobin cells end up being very stingy, you know, and they hold on to it because it's like, you know, there's so much. This is a very, this is a very good breakdown. You know, it's, it's interesting. There was a study done on, um, two elite, these, I think it was Swedish or Norwegians Two elite, um, it was a free diver and a triathlete and they were in this lab and they decided to study them both to see how well they use this thing called oxygen. Mm. And the triathlete in just about everything like VO2 max utilization was just crushing the free diver. And then at the end. Efficiency. Yep. So the free diver who had learned to use less oxygen got more ATP with less oxygen than the actual triathlete. And so that then kind of lends into, well, what has the free diving world been doing and teaching us that like we could learn from and, or what about hypoxia? Like, because Mm -hmm. that's essentially what's going on is we're creating acute hypoxia with in an environment that's loaded with CO2 and altitude does that naturally. Hmm. And so what are some of the, so this is, so, so where I was, I was getting it with that is, is, is I think something that many people, myself included, I, I've experienced a sensation of feeling overwhelmed yeah, or feeling like, man, I just can't get a breath. Almost like I'm like suffocating in a way, which is anxiety. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting. We used to kind of outline the analogy of this like buffet of air that we're just always consuming. It's making our bodies very inefficient. And so what we, we end up becoming rapacious with our, with our, our respiration where we're just <sighs> more. And, and then you, you, you create this cycle where you need more and you need more and you need more and you need more until you shut it off and you come back and you start working on hypoxia and you start working on, on slowing it down and you can start to actually reset your autonomic nervous system. And, and perhaps that figurative or literal sensation of I'm overwhelmed and feel like I'm suffocating starts to, starts to, uh, change to I feel fulfilled. I feel at ease. I feel strong. I feel stable. Noise, man. It's all noise. It really mm. is noise. And it's like, how much noise am I telling? What, what am I telling myself right now? Why am I telling myself that? What self-reflection is the foundation of, of it all. But mm. the tools that we have that are there is like, this is why I laid out like that arousal state continuum in the beginning is it's like, if we just look at this arousal state continuum and now we look at breathing, right? So I, I, we just laid out, Oh, here's what fast breathing does. So that'll move you into a higher arousal place. 
but I'm already high aroused and I don't like being here. Well, what does slow breathing do? Well, that calms me down. Hmm. So why wouldn't I just in- invest in that moment to just breathe? Because I'd like to keep this story running on what's going on to protect myself or avoid whatever is going on from what's, and it's like, no, no, no. That's where the self-reflective process has to come in. If I'm not in any real danger right now, why don't I just stop and Hmm. breathe until that changes or go hike up a hill or jump in some water and go for a swim and see what happens after you slow your breathing down on a swim, right? Like I have, I have an elite water polo player I was, I was working with this morning who's over in Europe and he's got this thing that goes on with um, indoor pools, which is a CO2 related thing. Right. And um, we, he, one of the things he's going to do is each day he's going to get in the pool for 20 minutes, even though he's already in the pool all the time, <laughs> but he's going to swim two to 500 yards for 20 minutes by taking one breath every seven strokes, something a water polo player is not accustomed to. I mean, their workout yesterday was 30 fifties, right? Like that was the hard workout. And then they were basically on top of the water, playing water polo, beating each other up under the water. And, you know, this is a 240 pound guy, right? Um, he's not under breathing on top of the water, man. He's over breathing on top of the water. Hmm. Yeah. The last thing, uh, do you, do you have to, do you have a hard, no. hard out by the way? Do you got to no, go right no. now? We're all right. Okay, cool. Uh, the last, last little bit that I wanted to touch on just to, to make the, the kind of breathing conversation a little more complete is the structural component. Yeah. You know, so most of what we've, what we've outlined has been metabolic related stuff, uh, nasal breathing compared to mouth breathing. And this is stuff that you'd, you'd see in the, yeah. the shut your mouth, save your life from, um, Kaplan, who he was a historian that studied native Americans and particularly like a lot of aspects of them. But one of the, the interesting standout things was their, their teeth and their jaw structure and the, the contrast of the colonials compared to them. The colonials are like these, you know, regal, you know, beautiful beings. And then there's like the, the, like the, the brutes of the native Americans, but they have these beautiful teeth and they're white and they have this great jaw structure and just, you know, better, better structural cellular function, even though they're these, these brutes that live in the woods. Um, you know, so what's happening there with nasal breathing compared to mouth breathing from like an ortho facial yeah. uh, perspective or a structural perspective? Well, you've got, you've got a, a, the, the nose was designed with the respiratory system in mind. The mouth was designed with the digestive system in mind. Um, but the mouth is also a point by which we can move a lot of air quickly if needed or, or communicate, Right. Um, the nose first starts with the fact that you've got two small holes, which actually force that, that begins the process of a a bit of resistance for me to, to get this reverse vacuum of my diaphragm and intercostals to really work. Right. When I provide a resistance, they engage more, right? Those and that's really important because this phenomenon called blood stealing occurs when we exercise and we get to a certain point where we're working harder than our breathing muscles will allow for. And so we're unfit, right? <laughs> well, blood stealing is where the blood gets diverted from the locomotor muscles to the diaphragm and the intercostals. And that's largely happening when my second door, my secondary or accessory muscle breathing muscles come on. So you're talking about the neck, anything from the neck, anything from the pec, right? Anything is attached to the arm, the limbs and the, the, the thorax, right? So the chest. So the importance of that nose begins with those holes. Then you, what you've got is you've got as much hair inside your nose as you have follicles on your head. So hmm. those are designed to gather dirt, bacteria, etc. Each one is coated with a fine layer of mucus, some more than others especially as you get further back when it turns in, when it becomes cilia, that is the first line of defense for the immune system and what we would call the nose microbiome. So it's pretty important in that that is creating your first line of defense for killer B cells, et cetera. All these things that 
that launch attacks, not only now, but even up to 10 years from now on things, pathogens and viruses that come in that it can remember and your immune system plays an attack on, right? So it's really important for that process to be there. Hmm. Then what you've got are your turbinates, which are these little hook-like kind of uh, pockets where the air kind of gets sucked in and it circles around. Right. And there's like three layers of those things of those turbinates to where it's like spinning up. So you're circulating the air. So there's really no way for shit to get through before yeah. it then enters the, into the sinus, the sinus cavities and then pulls down into the lungs. So it's pretty cool. That whole system's like the size of a billiard ball from my understanding. Yeah. The nasal concha. Yeah. Yeah. Is it called concha or conca? Concha? Nasal concha? Oh, okay. Conca? Yeah, I think it's the conca. <laughs> that so um, that said, a huge process, right? That requires air to be cleaned, warmed, humidified, and prepared to enter the lungs because the lungs have absolutely nothing in them to protect you from any of that shit that's coming in from the air. Now, mm. your mouth, on the other hand, has one line of defense. There are two tonsils on each side. And if you had those removed, there's a good chance you were a mouth breather as a kid because hmm. that line of defense got attacked a lot. <laughs> and so you had to do a lot of fighting from there versus from this wow. first line of defense. Interesting. Yeah. So that nose plays a huge role and that nose works up to moderate levels of exercise. Okay. Beyond that, you should be mouth breathing from what we've, we, what we've seen. Um, mm -hmm. There's a crossover. So there is a flip side to under breathing when working too hard. Interesting. Yep. And it makes you look more handsome. Yeah. More chiseled. Yeah. So that gets into like, 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 uh, are you familiar with like mewing John Mew? Oh, yep. The whole myofunctional oh, yeah, therapy yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know who he is. There's a lot of other people out there. But yeah, it, it's basically what you're doing is you're you're restructuring the jaw and the palate, um, the tongue. You're you're yeah. working out your mouth, um, which are exercises I prescribe with uh, many of the clients that I end up working with. Um, yeah. you know that goes in combination with things. This and and it's in large part due to the fact that people uh, at night. So when they're sleeping, their breathing is pretty dysfunctional, even though they may be mouth taping and breathing through their nose. Oh, really? So if your mouth, I've, I've been, uh, taping the mouth cause I'm, I'm, I, I definitely am a mouth breather if I'm, if I'm, while I'm sleeping. Um, I've been doing that for, for years. I find it to be incredibly beneficial. Is there any dr potential drawbacks or something that I, I could still be something to desire oh, yeah. with that? Oh Yeah. Hundred percent. Oh, yeah. You can do some. Yeah, I, I would suggest if you've never done any mouth uh, tongue exercises, um, mm. mouth exercises, you would greatly benefit. What about uh, cunning lingist? <laughs> that will help too. Nice. Now, now, <laughs> now you're gonna want to get that back of that tongue up to the roof of the mouth, though. Yeah, which is gonna be real hard to get your. That's tongue mewing. Up. Yeah, that's not that sexy. No. No. <laughs> so there's exercises you can do where you're pressing up like that. You can do you take your tongue out, do slow circles all the way outside of your mouth, right? Yep. Uh, opening up. Like there's a bunch of stuff. Um, and you can find it on the internet or you can hire. What was the uh, exercise you just did? You're opening up the back of your throat. So like, ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh. so you're opening up the back of the mouth and you're, you're moving the soft palate up. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And so would, would the recommendation perhaps be to do mouth taping plus using those nasal strips to create some more space? I'm not would actually a fan of mouth taping. Um, other than the really, fact, you yeah. son of a bitch. No, you're not a well, fan. No, no, no. Here's, I mean, look, if, if you are defaulting to mouth breathing at night, yeah, use it. However, oh. However, fix fix the mouth breathing at night however with with exercises my cleanup for that is four weeks of strict gear one gear two work mm. exercising and that yeah, usually right. eradicates the entire thing mouth taping is kind of like treating the symptom instead of the, the root correct yeah 
that makes sense. There's another um, interesting, and then we can we can wrap up soon. The the, the I just wanted to to mention the the uh, I know you've heard of the the Harvard I think is I think the the guy's name is Harvard the monkey experiment where they they put silicon plugs up the monkeys. Oh yeah, uh, done that with people too. Nasal passages. They've done that with people. Mm-hmm. Really. Yeah. Isn't that inhumane? No, no, no. People it, 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 with the monkeys, it caused them to be depressed and just like like know. everything, everything went to trash. Yeah, they did that with people. Um, oh boy, James did it. Oh, James did do it. Yeah, right. Everything, everything crashes. Yes. Your whole world yeah. falls apart. You get anxious. You get I'm depressed. Gonna have, you're I'm pissed. gonna go to an ENT. So I have a very deviated septum. As you yeah. can see that. Oh right? yeah, I see that. But when yeah. I when I exercise, I can do this. I open that stuff. Yeah, right. So I, I have really strong nostril. Like I've got really strong facial muscle. So I open up and I can get air now. Yeah. A buddy of mine called me. He was like, you're going to, he's like, you need to hear this. Anyway, his son <laughs> had had some problems. So they went to the ENT and she was like, oh, you've got a really deviated septum. Your turbinates are a mess. So she, so she cleaned them up, uh, did, did a little surgery. And she, he's like, bro, his life has changed night and day the kids exercising mm. waking up doing he's loving life he goes he's so much he goes so i went in and they're like oh yeah you got a deviated septum too and they cleaned me up and he's like dude like i feel like i have so much more air and i'm like i wonder if this is affecting my sleep at all I mean, even though yeah. i can sleep like 10 hours 10 and a half i mean i slept 10 and a half hours saturday night so yeah i don't have a problem that bad, but I wonder how much of that is getting a little messy because. So you're you're gonna go? You haven't done it yet. Correct. I'm gonna go next month. Mm. Yep. Cool, man. Tell me about it. I'm I excited. I'd be excited to hear about that. What do you think of uh, nasal strips? Uh, fine at night for like fine at night training. Tra- no, what about training no, with them? No, no, you'll fuck. You, you can you can really mess yourself up because you're opening really? up more than you are capable of. And so you're going to move more air than you probably should through your nose. Huh. Now, that's if you're going to push nasal breathing. If you're going to listen and know when to switch once you go beyond moderate exercise, like that's that's the importance of really getting into the gear training, the gear system, and understanding yep. like, oh, I should be switching into mouth breathing at this point. What would the issue be of, of taking too much air through the nose? Oh, you'll fucking, you'll dry it out. You'll get a bloody nose. You'll, uh, you can get sinus infections. You can screw yourself up. I've done it. Interesting. I've done it all. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, I really appreciate you, man. Is there anything else that we should, we should touch on in, in relation to, uh, to any of this I, stuff? I, I think Do you think that would make it more complete? The angle to go at things like, you know, look. Here's the arousal continuum. Here's how it works. Here's what's going on. Yeah, that feels, I feel like that, that felt like a, a important digestible piece of conversation. Yeah, I really I mean, appreciate you outlining it that day, way. You, you should probably be slowing it down with the breathing stuff, not ramping it up. And if you're yeah. running low all day, you should probably ramp it up. But then on either end, if that's a continual thing every day, time to do a little bit deeper self-reflection. If you want to not be depressed and you want to have a decent jawline, breathe through your nose. Yes. And maybe do some do some some mewing exercises. That's- Is there any other any any other uh, like myo? I don't know. My, lack of myofunctional therapy. I'm, I, I'd imagine that's probably mu. Is that that's a term? Is there is there other exercises that you would recommend or videos or do you do anything like that? Uh, I, uh, I, I do I do stuff with clients like that. I haven't put anything out. Um, there's a like look. You can find stuff. There's actually an app. I think there's a an app called snore lab. And then they recommend a another app. That's like a mouth training. Like it's like a, you know, mouth training for snore. Hmm. Okay, uh, cool. That'd be good to look into. Yeah, they're, they're oh. really easy to find. I mean, there's, the other, stuff all, there's stuff out there all over the place. You don't want to. The other thing that's 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 interesting in relation to all this stuff is um, I wrote down a couple different things. There's a study published in the Journal of Muscles, Ligaments, and Tendons found that using an extended up to the palatine spot or the roof of the mouth results in 30% greater knee flexion, peak torque during isokinetic exercises than having tongue in middle or floor. So that's an interesting thing, which gets into a lot of like old ancient yogi stuff, yeah. you know, completing the microcosmic yeah. orbit is, is, yeah. is like the, the like the old, 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 old yogi way of saying that. And the big toe, like just so we're clear, yeah. like, 
Yeah. Yeah. So creating that. So from like the microcosmic orbit perspective, that's the suggesting that there's like this, this channel around the back of your body that then wraps up across the top. And then the kind of the circuit is the roof of the mouth and the tongue. Yeah. And you open that circuit, you have an open circuit and you're not able to circulate energy. You close that circuit. Now suddenly you're connecting this thing called the microcosmic orbit, which is connecting these two channels front and back. And that's like the very esoteric Eastern lens on this. But then we have Western science to have completely different terminology, but essentially suggest the same thing, which is very interesting. Yeah. You're connected. <laughs> you know, full circle, full circle. I love Full circle. It. All right. Uh, what? So people. So you have the shift app. What? What else should people? Uh, can you? Can you like outline like what? The, what that is and who that would be for? Or just like anything it's, that would be relevant. To- app.com forward slash breathwork. You can do one of our assessments, which is the exhale assessment, and there will be some stuff in there that they can then follow if they want. From there, our membership is like thirty bucks a month, where we integrate the breathing gears into a lot of the strength and conditioning and or endurance work and even some breathe and move stuff. Um, It's all in there. Um, There's educational stuff. There's webinar stuff. Um, We've got seminars in there. Emily has a skill of stress, which is fantastic, which that would really get to the noise thing um, for a lot of people. And then Martin and I have recently released the uh, decoding the metabolic breath print, which is literally kind of, looking walking people through this three-part series of how what and why breathing is effective and what we're seeing and how health is actually related to breathing cool love it man um thank you so much i really enjoyed this conversation i feel like this is this is meaningful i think this is helpful for a lot of people um all right that is it that is all thank you all for tuning in i'll see you next week Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you did, feel free to tag us on the Instagram. You can find me at Aaron Alexander on there. Uh, also check out the YouTube channel that is at Align Podcast. Subscribe over there so you get each week's videos and instructional content. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for reviews. Thanks for joining you. I'll see you next week.